Good morning again, ladies. Good, Good morning. morning. Are you all ready to dissect this word this morning at the round table? <laughs> Amen. Amen. God be yes. Ready as I ever be. <laughs> Amen, 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 amen. First, I'm going to open up in prayer. We're going to just open up in a little prayer this morning before we begin to dissect this word this morning. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you this morning for everything that you've done and what you shall do, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, O oh God. God, we ask, O oh God, that this morning, Father God, that you will come in and meet us at the point of our need, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, O oh God. God, we ask, O oh God, that this morning be a learning experience for us, Father God, something that eyes haven't seen and ears haven't heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man that which you have in store for us as women on this morning, Father God, as we begin to study, to show ourselves approved, O oh God, a workman that need not be ashamed, O oh God. Rightly divine the word of truth this morning, Father God. As we dig deep into your word, this morning, Father God, let us find ourselves in the word, Father God. For you said, Father God, that your word will not return unto you, boy, but it will do that which you've established it to do, Father God. Let it establish us, O oh God, in the word that we can see ourselves as Ruth, O oh God. We can see ourselves as Naomi, Father God. We can find our Boaz this morning, Father God. Or we've already found our Boaz, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Father God. So we just ask, Father God, that you would come on in, Father God, and overshadow us this morning, Father God, with your glory, oh God, with your presence, Father God, breathe on us the Ruach this morning, Father God, that as you begin to breathe on us, Father God, we will digest it in, Father God, word for word, Father God, line upon line and precept upon precept, Father God, show us something, Father God, that we've never seen before, Father God, do the miraculous this morning, Father God, show forth, oh God, your countenance upon us, Father God, and be gracious unto us this morning, Father God, as we go forth in your word, in Jesus' mighty name, we pray, we cover this prayer, we fill it in the blood of Jesus, and we say that it is so. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give a brief narrative this morning about the book of Ruth. Um, Before we get started, um, it goes like this. The story of Ruth is set in a time of judges a time when there was Mm -hmm. no king to rule the land, a time of frequent oppression and religious and moral degeneracy. The book of Ruth reflects a time of peace between Israel and Moab. It shows what true faith and perseverance truly looked like during a time when famine had hit Bethlehem, Judah, until the time when God began to release blessings in that place again. Here we see an Israelite, Naomi, and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, travel back to Bethlehem, Judah, not knowing where their fate lies, but understanding that God was their source. And and Ruth said to Naomi that her God shall be her God, and that where she lies and dies, she shall also lie and die there as well. So we're going to just get into the words this morning. I have a couple of questions, and when you all dig in, feel free if you have questions that you want to add to the table discussion this morning. Um, Whatever you want to say, feel free to say it on this morning so that we can get an understanding one with another this morning as we dissect this word of food, starting at the first chapter, one through four in the book of Ruth. Amen. Amen. So my first question to you ladies is, as women of God, how can you say that you relate to Ruth's situation? Um, Being a single woman, Janita, how do you see yourself relating to Ruth's situation? Um, Wow, that's a good question. I would say for myself, um, that being in her shoes, I would say for a single woman as myself, Knowing what I want from a man, knowing, knowing what I'm seeking in a man, um, comes with, you know, responsibility of me preparing myself to be, you know, to be to be a wife. Um, in so many instances, as I was, as we were reviewing, as I was studying and reviewing this, I said, hmm, questions was coming in my mind, you know, how would I prepare myself, you know, for this, you know, so I was trying, I was trying to get a, um, imagination going on, you know, how would I be able to prepare myself? But I would say for that, you know, for how she prepared herself was a lot of obedience. So you have to be with, you know, being a woman, single woman, you have to be obedient. You have to know what you want, you know, what you're coming with 
to bring to the table for a man. So for myself, I would say, for you know, it would have to be obedience that would have to set in and, and a lot of preparation because in marriage you have to have order. You know, some things have to be set in order. And um, as I'm single now, you know, just preparing and um, just, you know, just doing the things that I would do for myself so that when he does come that I will already have, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be easy. It wasn't, be, it wouldn't be so hard for me to prepare myself because as I'm single, I just believe God is preparing me for such a time as, you know, it's for marriage. So that's what I would say for us that. Amen. 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 And First Lady yes. Jackie Mabry, how would you say that God preserved you for your Boaz? For me, I stayed single uh, for five years. I didn't date, and I just um, stayed single and did the things of church fellowship and going to church, and I prayed, and I told God to keep me and to prepare me as a wife, make me the wife that you will have me to be for the husband that you have for me and to work on my character as a wife. And as I was staying single and preparing myself, I got in the kitchen more often cooking because at that time when I was single, um, I was working long hours. And I really didn't do a lot of cooking, but only on the weekends. So I started cooking more often, preparing myself to cooking, and um, just seeking the Lord, you know, more and more, and just doing things that he would have me to do and to learn how to be submissive. I asked him to teach me to be submissive as well, because first I told God I got to be first submissive to him because he's the head of my life. And then teach me to be submissive to my husband. So when you do send the husband that you have for me, that I will be submissive as a wife. So yeah. it comes with a lot of obedience, preparation, because if you want to be a husband, you can't be buying um, restaurant food because that man is going to want cook food. And if you're going to be a wife, you know, you got to learn how to be able to have that communication, to submit and be grounded in that marriage, have a, a communication, trust, and obedience, and have know what you're looking for in that relationship yeah. as a wife as well. And that's what I did for me. So I took that single time for five years, and I, then not only that, I searched out me, took mm-hmm. the time to know me as well, mm-hmm. and that's what I did. Amen. 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 As for myself, um, because this is my second marriage, um, I still use the same ingredients that I used the first time, but I did things a little differently this time than I did before. Um, I, I wrote down and I asked God specific things that I was looking for in a husband, but I made sure that I put in there that I wanted him to be a God-fearing man. I wanted him to know the Lord. I wanted him to love me like Christ loves the church. I wanted him to be able to be the priest of the household. And being the priest, he would be the head of the household. And I would take a back seat and just be his backbone. Um, And the second time around, uh, what I learned differently is, um, as you said, um, First Lady Mabry, Um, more communication, opening up more, not bringing in the old baggage into the new season of your life in the new marriage that you're now entering into. You have to let go of um, old baggage, old ways, old ways of doing things, old ways of thinking in order for you to step into that new place with that new husband that God has sent for you and um, truly, truly, truly dedicate yourself to your spouse you know, giving your whole heart to him, not just half your heart, but your whole heart, because you can't go in it halfway. You can't put one foot in the door and one foot out the door. You have to have both feet on the threshing floor at the same time in order for you to be able to see that God has truly sent this man to you. And as my husband now has always told me, he said, God showed me you in a dream. 
And I told him, I said, if God showed you me in a dream, I trust God. So I trust you because I trust the Lord first and foremost. So I trust what God has shown you. And he said, you know, I know the type of wife that you can be because God had showed him the type of wife that I could be. But I had to um, think a little different. I had to do things a little bit more differently than the first go round um, for the second time around. And I have a greater appreciation now at this time in my life, a greater appreciation for the marriage that I have than the first time. The first time I was a very submissive wife and doing the things that I was supposed to do, but I didn't have that evenly yoked partner with me. You know, we were unevenly yoked, you know, at in our lives. So that made a big difference too. When you're unevenly yoked, you want to be yoked with the person that you're going to marry. You all want to be on the same page, have the same flavor. Um, you all have two different DNAs, so you're not going to think of like all the time, but can you meet in the middle? Can you compromise? Can you, um, See where God is trying to take the marriage, not where your flesh want to take it, but where God wants to take the marriage. So in that, I pose my second question. In today's society, do you think our women would have followed Naomi back to her homeland? So First Lady Majory, what do you have to say? Truly, in our time today, no. They would not have followed her back to her land today because for one, they would have said, um, I appreciate your offer. I will keep in touch, but I'm going to go my way, and I'm going to allow you to go your way. So the time that we're living in today, that would never happen. And if it do happen, it's 1% out of 99 that will do that in our time Elder today. Elder Janita, what do you have to add to that? I will agree with uh, First Lady Mabry because, you know, today's women now, they're not looking, you know, to be in the word of God. You know, they just want what they want, a now, now, now thing I want it now. So they're not really um, seeking. A lot of them are not seeking the Lord first and what they want out of a man. It's for self-pleasure, what I want, I, me, and my thing, you know. So they're not seeking God as counsel. And the ones that are, you know, are the ones that, you know, you have to be in order with this thing. So if you're out of order, then it's not going to work. So I would say, and even if they were to follow it, that would be a good thing because this this story is actually a, would be a good example of how you can follow you. But a lot of women don't want to be biblically taught. A lot of them don't. But for the ones do, then, you know, I would say that they will have a successful marriage. Amen. 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 And can I um, just say something on that, too, that note, too, it will be, first of all, you got to see what type of relationship you and that mother-in-law will have first. A lot of wives, today um, don't have too much of a good relationship with their mother-in-laws, and some do. So Mm -hmm. I would still say it would, no, because they wouldn't trust them. They would think, what plot do you have behind this? What agenda do you have? It's something to it that you would want me to come with you, or what is your game? I lost, you know, I lost my husband. So they'll be thinking, you either want my money from what my husband left me. You really don't love or care about me. You're just going to use me. That will be their mind setting today that we're living in. But, again, if you do find a mother-in-law that truly, truly who love you and care about you and will tell you that, and you all do have a good relationship and it happens, that's a blessing from God. If you find that kind of relationship today. But like I say again, one person out of 99% will do that in our time today. And just like Janita said, 
you you got to really want that. Um, first of all, what kind of training, what kind of upbringing did you have? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. What kind of training was you taught at home, and did you know what kind of training she had for her family? You know, it'll be you'll be looking at those angles. Can we get along in one household? Would, would, would there be falling out, disagreements? It'll be looked at that way. Um, would you understand me if I'm I'm mourning? Would you understand what I'm going through? Would you have a heart for me? It'll be questions going on like that. So, again, it will truly be today's society hard to really say, but that 1%. I would choose. And here in the book of Ruth, we know that um, Naomi had two daughter-in-laws. She didn't just have one daughter-in-law, but she had two daughter-in-laws. One was Orpha and one was Ruth. And um, she asked both of them to go back to their own homeland once she had lost her husband and her two sons, which they were married to. And But one thing that Naomi that Ruth did that was different from Oprah is Oprah turned and gave her mother-in-law a kiss and went her way back to her homeland. Ruth said to her, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from falling after thee, but whithersoever thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. So she was willing. She had a willing heart to Mm -hmm. follow after her mother-in-law because in order for her to be a Moabite woman, she didn't practice the same rituals that Ruth, that Naomi um, practiced in her um, as being an Israelite. They practiced two different types of um, religions and traditions. So mm-hmm. for her to say that I will make your God my God, your people my people, where you die, I will die, where you lodge, I will lodge, that takes a lot of obedience. That takes a lot of character. That takes on putting away the flesh and self and taking on the godly type of character to say that I will follow after you because you're following after a God that I want to know, you know, in this instance. And we do. We live in a microwave generation where they feel like they're entitled to certain things. So they wouldn't um, probably follow her in this dispensation of life. They would probably do their own thing and go their own way because they don't want to, for one, be controlled by anybody. They want to do their own thing when they want to do it, how they want to do it, where they want to do it, and with whom they want to do it with, not understanding that it's principles to life. It's principles Mm -hmm. to life. And when you follow God's principles and God's statutes and God's um, order and direction, then the Holy Spirit leading guide you into all truth, you won't miss the mark. You know, you may have a disagreement, but you will disagree to agree, you know, agree to disagree on things. You can you can get an understanding with one another. You can live with one another because God is governing the situation and the circumstance. So I thank you two ladies for those answers. And it brings me to my third question. Can we say that the scripture in Proverbs 18 and 22 is what we see in the book of Ruth, where that the scripture says, whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Seeing that Naomi instructed her daughter-in-law as to what to do to get Boaz. So I'm going to let um, Elder Cannon go first and see what you have to say. Okay. Um, Well, I would say for the Proverbs 18.22, that um you know we have to once again be be obedient and in preparation in regards to what how she was preparing herself to be with how Ruth was preparing herself to be with Boaz. And so when we when we look at that uh particular proverb that was the mother um speaking to her son, you know, so she was preparing because she had messed up. You know, because she knew that she wasn't supposed to have been with David, but they were together and everything, and they did what they did. But she had some mistakes down the line. You know, there were some mistakes within herself. 
so as we read as, as we read on with that particular thing i would say that um most women will be and most not depending on their upbringing depending on how they were raised, depending on what instructions were taught to them in their upbringing, and even in their upbringing, how they applied it to their lives. Because you can be told the right thing to do in your upbringing and go a different way on your own. So, you know, it's it's kind of a catch-22 because it truly depends on that person, whether they want to continue to stick with what they was taught with and learn from it and not let it depart from them from what their parents have taught them, or they can go they up, go on their own and do it the way that they want to do it. So it, it truly depends on that individual, that woman individually, if they want to, you know, follow that, follow that rule. That's what I have for that. Yeah. Okay. First Lady Mabry, what do you have to add? Well, a woman is not supposed to chase a man or find a man. It's the man who's supposed to find the woman. Because when he finds that wife, he finds favor with the Lord. So to say to that, we live in a society that has told women today that, oh, it's nothing wrong with um, proposing to a husband, a man. That goes back all the way back to how we was raised. We was raised to wait on a man to find you and let him propose to you. Mm-hmm. If you want the, if he wants the favor with God, it never said that the woman supposed to go chasing after a guy or a man. And if you want a husband and you asking God for a husband, we supposed to stand still and wait. Wait on the Lord. Don't go before God because God don't need your help. So if you're saying, Lord, I want a husband, what else is you asking God? Is is that just that one-line prayer? You need more to that one-line prayer. Lord, I need a husband, but I'm going to wait on you. I'm not going to look for him. I'm going to wait on you to send him to me. But while I'm in waiting, help me to stay celibate. Help me to sustain myself. Help me to keep myself because when I do meet the husband that you have for me, I want the I want the blessing that you have for us together. So we still have to go back to how the family structure has been set up. How was the family told in their upbringing? How was the family, how was the daughter told to go in her dating years? What what did the mother and father sit down and tell their son and daughter when it was time for them to date? Did they tell them to wait, don't go out there um, flossing their stuff before time, or did they tell them wait and stay celibate? You, that's a question. Mm-hmm. It's a question mark right yeah. there. What was told in that yeah. household? We don't know that question mark until we meet the daughter, until we meet the son, and we sit down and have a conversation with them, and then they open up and tell us, well, in my household, my mother and father didn't talk to us. Mm. So that opens up the door to tell you right there, there was no instruction of how they was raised. So there was, they just did anything. But when you get to the daughter and then she sit down and talk to you, well, in my household, every Friday was uh, family night that we sat at the table and talked. My mother and father taught us that we're to keep ourselves until we get married. There go the question. She told you what her household did every Friday. They sat at the table every Friday, had family discussion. So, therefore, you will know what was said. But when you don't know what was said, it's hard to really figure out what was discussed at the family table. And that's where we're at today in society. We don't know what was the family table like. We don't know what was discussed every Friday at the family table. We don't know what was said at the family dinner until you sit down and have that conversation. And society now 
and TV have taught our children totally opposite of what the plan of God word said for our life. So go back to that. A lady must wait to be found. She must keep herself and wait for her husband, say celibate, and let him find her. Not her, go find him. A man don't want a wild woman. He want a humble woman, a virtuous 31 woman. He wants a woman that's going to be appealing, loving. He wants to take on a woman to his mother that his mother's going to be pleased with. That he know that mm, he could take her home to her, and his mother's gonna say, "Wow, she's a beautiful woman. She's respectful, well spoken. I could tell she was well raised. That type of woman is what the mother looks for in her son to bring home. Vice versa, as for the woman to bring home to her parents, the man." Vice versa. So that's my answer to the question. Well, in chapter three of Ruth, we can see where that um, Naomi told Ruth, Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put on thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. So in this instance, I would say that God was showing himself in the midst of this situation. It wasn't the traditional thing. It was the traditional thing of the way they did it back then in the Bible um, in this instance um, right here. But we can also um, say that, you know, um, we can see where that um, even in Genesis when um, Abraham sent Eleazar to seek after Isaac's wife. He sent, he sent Eleazar, his servant, to seek after Isaac's wife for him, you know, to find this, this particular woman that they were looking for for Isaac to marry and things of that nature. Here, it still gives us a sense of tradition because he, she said in this book right here, wait until he instructs you as to what to do. So she wasn't going on her own instruction once she got to the threshing floor, once she lied down next to him, and once he discovered on the marble the next day that she was right there, she was to wait until the man instructed her as to what to do. So it still falls into that, um, into the, when a man finds a woman, he finds a favor with God. And um, he finds it's a good thing and I came in favor with the Lord. So we can see here that he still found her because she was laying still at his feet. And she was covered. But she uncovered his feet so that he would know somebody was lying beneath him. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's a good point that you all brought out. So my, my next question is... Being that Boaz was from Bethlehem, Judah, and Ruth from Moab, two different cultures, what do you think God was trying to show us in this instance? Um, First Lady Mabry, what do you think God was trying to show us? Okay. Although they were from two different cultures, God can use anybody. And he could turn any situation around. But due to the fact, when it gets down to the lineage of Jesus, God has to show us his hands in everybody's life or who he is and how he turns them around. So in this, I look at God is showing us, no matter what background it came from, although Bethlehem do me first of all means house of bread, and from that it lets us know that Jesus is breaking down and getting the, the house in order 
getting it prepared for preparation for Jesus to come. So in order to get the preparation for Jesus to come, breaking the the difference of their household down so that the two of them are from different lineage, but by them getting married, her lineage is not going to matter because she's coming over to his lineage, and they're going to become as one. And God's hands are still upon him because he already has to get in favor because he found her. He has favor within her as she followed the instruction of her mother-in-law. So, therefore, they already took one step. So that's how I look at it. Can of we Jesus say, too, Christ. that the word of God, which says he has no respect of person, um, is yes. being shown here. For God's will to be fulfilled, he will use whosoever and whatsoever resource necessary to fulfill the will for one's life. And what God has yes. joined together, let no man put asunder. And this was to be the lineage of Jesus. What do you have to say, Elder Cannon? Um, for this particular one, I would say, even though as we look at these four chapters, very, very powerful information, and reviewing and studying these things, you can go on and on about it because the revelation that God gives you, well, what He's giving me, and so even though they were two people from the two different places. I just believe that the picture that, you know, the picture of our Redeemer, that God was in the midst of it. Because here you have, you have Boaz, you have Ruth. In there, you know, there was, um, um, you have the mother-in-law who was, who was bitter because of the things that happened to her, losing her sons and her husband. So she became bitter. But when she went back home, it appears to be that, you know, God was just, he was behind the scenes, sort of. So here we have Boaz and Ruth painted as a beautiful picture of redemption a thousand years ago before Jesus and their descendants came as our Redeemer. And so then we look at Ruth's needs are our needs because she was she wanted to live a life of, of love. She wanted a home. She wanted hope, uh, which is which was our everlasting inheritance. These were the things that she came in contact with because of her obedience. And um, then we look at uh, Boaz because he did not turn Ruth away. He promised to redeem her. And then Boaz had no duty to redeem. Boaz had no duty to redeem Ruth, but it was the love and the mercy that moved him. And so Boaz, look at him, is redeemed Ruth at a cost to himself. Because then we look at the closer relatives refused to pay the cost. He, didn't, he was in total gain for himself. He didn't want to, you know, he wasn't looking out for the poor people. He was just looking out for self-gain, as we read on in this uh, book of Ruth. And then we have uh, uh, Boaz, who was satisfied the kinsman's requirements. Through, um, uh, um, Ruth, uh, Ruth's husband, and I'm sorry, Naomi's husband, Emily, he was Ruth's close kinsman. So here we have uh, Boaz married to Ruth, and she belonged to him and him to her. Um, Boaz personally accomplished Ruth's redemption. It was his work alone from the start. But Boaz did not. He did more than simply restore Ruth and Naomi lives. Boaz brought life and blessings that transformed their lives through Jesus Christ that it continues to transform uh, lives on today. So that's what I got out of it. You know, even though they were from two different places, but the love of God, in the, even though it was bitterness, it was, you know, bittersweet, if you will, but to, to see the scene behind God in this story is just a, so phenomenal because it brought them together to the love of God. And that's what I have for that. Amen. 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 So that brings me to my next question, which you touched on it a little bit. Why do you think Boaz showed Ruth so much favor in his field? And we know that um, in the second chapter, starting at the 12th verse, it says, the Lord, Boaz said to her, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, let me find favor. 
in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaidens. And so um, it shows me right here that that's the act of compassion, which also the Father has for us. Boaz showed her compassion, and he showed her love, you know, through, through it all. You know, he was showing her that even though you're not from our 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 lineage or anything like that, um, yet I still will respect you. Yet I will still show love and kindness and compassion upon you. For the favor of God is resting upon you. The recompense of God is upon you. You have you have chosen to take on um, the Israelite culture, and so in that, God is rewarding you. And you're going under his yeah. wings, and you're trusting him. And so, what do you all want to add to that, um, um, Elder Shannon? I'll let you. Oh. You go ahead, Jackie. Go. It's fine. I just want to say, could it be that he possibly watched her at her quiet time in prayer, as she prayed to God? No matter what it was that she went through, she never gave up on praying and thanking God. Even though she was, you know, what she went, you know, went through and everything, but she still was thanking God, you know, and and praying to Him. How now, where she's at, she has met more than enough. He has been watched her and said. This woman is so much. How can I go through so much? See, she's What's going on? We're getting some feedback. Excuse me, ladies. We're getting some feedback from somewhere. Um, there's some noise going on, and I can't hear. Can you hear now? Yes, yeah, speak a little louder. I said, could it be that he watched her as she was probably praying in her quiet time and wondering, okay, she can do so much and and, and the, all the time, she still have passion. She's still showing love. She has to get God may step in or whatever the needs is for your children. 
We just don't know how God is going to come in and do what it is that we need him to do. So that's how I'm looking at this picture, that she never stopped praising God. She kept praying and when she had time alone. She probably wants to want to feel stop praising God, doing her thing, saying, Lord, I thank you that I have life. Lord, I thank you. Now I have food to eat. I'm not in a family anymore. That's how I'm looking at this. And now prayers is no blessing. We just don't know how I bless and this is how this. Well, ladies, I would like to take this time to thank you all for coming on God's Manifested Glory um, Ministries line on today, the podcast. It was a pleasure of you all being a co-host with me today, First Lady Jackie Mabry of Principal Harvest and Elder Janita Cannon from Honoring Hearts Ministry and myself, Sister Tree Soap. Until we meet again, may God prosper you and keep you. May the favor of God rest upon you all the days of your life. You all be blessed. Until we meet again on the Round Table Talk. Have a great day, ladies. Bye-bye. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.